Hi, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here today. Thanks a lot for coming to this session. Um, yeah, it's great to be here after exchanging on the mailing list on Vcap Dev and with issues. It's great to meet you uh, guys. So this talk is an introduction to a both session I'm proposing tomorrow and how we can adapt Cloud Foundry to organization context. Uh, so let me introduce a bit about myself. I'm working at Orange. Orange is uh, one of the largest um, telco operators in uh, Europe and in Africa. Uh, it's present in uh, 29 markets with 240 million subscribers. And so obviously this requires uh, lots of development, lots of software, uh, in the thousand apps, developers, and, and apps. And so PASS um, uh, is relevant in this case. Uh, a short disclaimer, um, uh, Orange is a federated group, uh, so it's made of um, Lots of uh, different business units and entities that have large autonomies. And um, I won't be speaking for all of Orange. I'm working mainly in a small team, uh, which is um, in the corp, in Central Corp, which is helping uh, the teams in, um, in subsidiaries to, to adopt pass. So it's possible that you hear a slightly different uh, voice in some other entities. Um, so I've been working with uh, Cloud Foundry a few years and contributing uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to docs and uh, to a few pull requests. Uh, and you can contact me on Twitter and uh, at this email. So, um, adopting a pass to meet new business objectives um, often requires more than uh, providing an out of the box uh, Cloud Foundry instance. And uh, the integration into the ecosystem, to the organization ecosystem, and support for the transformation um, of the processes uh, might be key to um, the Cloud Foundry adoption. Um, so I'd like to do a short poll um, on um, how you, you, you stand with respect to Cloud Foundry. How many of you are just starting to learn Cloud Foundry? Okay, maybe 20%. How many of you are actually using and consuming Cloud Foundry? Okay, one fourth again. How many of you are providing Cloud Foundry to others, uh, platform operators? Okay, a little less. And how many contribute, are contributing actu actually to Cloud Foundry? Um, coding and vendors. Okay, sure, thanks, great. So I'll start with uh, sharing some of our uh, organization-specific requirements, and then uh, ways we have adopted um, uh, Cloud Foundry to, uh, in, within the range. And then we'll think about um, potential uh, future uh, Cloud Foundry extensions that could, be, um, could maybe allow to get some of these uh, org specific requirements easier in the futures. Um, and for this, um, I will be using the impact mapping uh, uh, methodology. So the impact mapping uh, methodology was uh, introduced by uh, Goshko Adzik. Um, the idea is to, when we introduce um, uh, um, a pass is to formalize uh, the objectives. Why are we are doing? Why are we do? Sorry. Why are we introducing that? Um, uh, how can we measure that uh, this goal is rich? And then, um, who can help us uh, reach these goals in terms of actors? Who in the organization uh, will help us uh, deliver this? And then uh, we go on the how. Um, what behaviors will we observe? Uh, in this population um, that will trigger this, uh, uh, these objectives. And then finally, um, what at the plat as a platform operator uh, providing a pass, uh, what can I do uh, in terms of deliverable to trigger those behaviors uh, and to support them? Um, hmm. So I'll be sharing uh, our impact map uh, with this co uh, color coding. Um, I've added uh, on the deliverables um, um, a bit more details in terms of what we already delivered, what stuff we have not yet delivered, but we, we, we see some solutions around, and stuff we have not a uh, solution yet, uh, which is currently blocked. Um, so as you see, the map is quite large when we expand it. So I would uh, zoom through specific elements of the map. Um, and to give you some context, uh, you will have some um, breadcrumb at the top telling you where we are. 
And if you want to, um, it, it might be fast at times, so if you want to take time to read it afterwards, uh, it's, uh, it's online, uh, either at this URL, or it's also um, in a JSON format on GitHub. So you can clone it, and maybe if you find it useful, try to, to do that for your, uh, your own organization. So why are we introducing a pass uh, in our context? Um, so nothing really new. We want our projects to deliver uh, faster, sooner. Um, with, I'll let you read the kind of measurement that we have um, with a set of targets uh, that the methodology, the impact mapping is, um, is suggesting us. Uh, we want our application to, um, to be um, more reliable, to improve the quality of service, and obviously to reduce the cost. Um, who will be helping us to do that? Um, what are the actors in our system? So primary actors uh, would be the one that would be consuming the pass. Um, so the developers and the operation teams. Um, so when we, when we go and ask the developers, okay, how can, how can you help us um, get those objectives? Um, so uh, improve those measurements in terms of delivering faster, sooner, safer, and, and cheaper. Um, they said, do you think the pass can, can help us uh, do that? They say, well, yeah, let me try. Um, so um, can you try that on your own project? I say, well, uh, I'd rather test that on toys uh, for now. Um, what do you need to test that on toys? Um, um, can you use a public instance? Well, not really. Uh, the um, corporate uh, rules is not allowing me to, um, to go public for now. I could just use toys uh, with uh, random data, but um, if you want really me to, um, to use with uh, uh, real data, you want to, to, to do, uh, give me a private instance on-prem. Um, so that's what we've uh, started doing. Um, so it's been really uh, starting instantiating um, Cloud Foundry uh, on-prem uh, on two, uh, the two yes uh, AIS that we have. Uh, vCloud and OpenStack, and taking into account um, some specificities that we have around uh, a specific network architecture, um, with respect to outgoing traffic um, and to uh, network isolation. Uh, so it's been really um, uh, working well, and uh, Bosch was really helping in terms of automation for that, so we have great feedback around that. Um, and we connected to the UA uh, for getting identity. Um, uh, we still have uh, some work to be done around backups uh, on week week. Uh, then we started uh, providing access to the common services, SMTP, outgoing internet access, uh, through um, uh, custom service brokers. Um, similarly, for the lo logs, um, so we've been using Splunk to centralize the logs, and so still um, lots of activities around that to make it more multi-tenant, um, to, um, to make it easier to search uh, and find the logs. Um, and the log search seems really um, uh, something great we'll be looking at. Um, and uh, uh, so um, our instance is there, it's running great. And so the first feedback we have from developers, uh, testing tools, so CMS, um, development tools is that yes, uh, the rich objectives is getting much faster to, to provision. And so now um, we get back to them. Uh, are you now ready to develop your own app on Cloud Foundry? Um, and they say, well, only when the operation teams will, will agree um, and will trust it. So what does it take? Well, the operation teams tell us um, uh, we'd like to have the same level of quality that we have on um, traditional um, shared hosting. So they ask us for multi-AZ support, um, and they ask us for multi-data center, multi-regions as well. So yeah, it's not yet ready, but OK, can you still, uh, developers, can you still start developing your app, even though it's not ready? We're working on that. So yeah, they, they start doing that. Um, so. Well, basic uh, Cloud Foundry setup is doing great. Our prediction-ready pass is mastering, uh, still some work. And so when um, the developers start developing their apps on, um, on Cloud Foundry, 
they have two ways. Um, the most logical one, uh, which looks really promising, um, is adopting the cloud native architecture. And luckily, uh, the industry and Matt Stin in particular has been uh, doing a great job at documenting that. Um, and so the Spring Boot support, we, have a Java, we are mainly Java development. Uh, the Spring Boot support with production ready support, uh, support for microservice architecture seems really promising, so we're working actively on that. Um, and yeah, this looks great for innovators. Um, and, um, but also we have lots of legacy apps uh, that will take time to, to transform and to adapt. So we are thinking, okay, can we help the others as well? Can we help the existing app to conform to 12-factor apps? So this we've started with um, um, apps that would um, uh, uh, have some state, uh, session state, so starting some work around um, providing session state store. Um, then as well, um, the apps that are using the persistent file system not really for intensive writes, but maybe for configurations that are saved on disk uh, and that needs to be present uh, across restarts. So we're working with uh, RaxCS and um, either with native APIs or uh, with the file system abstraction using Fuse. Um, and as well, uh, they exchange uh, files with other apps, so working to provide uh, gateways. Um, so that uh, this section is easier. And again, and also the single sign on uh, SSO. Um, so then, yeah, um, uh, we have few uh, apps that are being developed like that. Uh, and the developers are really happy. So we get back to the ops. And, um, and then we ask them, uh, are you ready now to operate that? Um, and so um, again, they have two choices. Either they adopt um, the kind of cloud native um, practices, uh, which is greatly described. Um, and um, so this, this uh, translates into uh, versioning the app config in Git, um, pulling the app binaries from repository uh, manually uh, or in script prior to pushing, uh, and automating uh, development workflows from CLI individual steps. Um, and the app would be providing some uh, production features for troubleshooting, uh, for dynamic config. Um, so yes, it's really, really promising, uh, this, so we are actually, uh, actively working on that. Um, but as well, we, we see some uh, limitation and obstacles in our case, um, which is the organization is, uh, is slow to change, maybe slower than software in our case. Um, so, um, we're still lacking some dedicated ops um, uh, in many cases. Um, the project versus product uh, transition is not yet done, so we see a lot of time uh, projects um, and not uh, long-term product teams. Uh, even in some cases, we have also software for a number of cases, which, is make, which makes it hard to, uh, to have business capability teams, um, which is mainstream practice. Um, and another aspect is, um, uh, the transition from centralized governance to decentralized autonomy. The fact that business capability team are really uh, have the autonomy to, um, to do things, uh, it takes time. Uh, also, the, um, the leg leg legacy apps takes time to transform, technically. Uh, and sometimes we see uh, gaps in culture between uh, developers and, and ops and in, in tools being used. So we were also asking, how can we help the vast majority? Um, and in our case, um, it looks like um, getting from uh, centralized governance to decentralized autonomy um, would be easier for the organization to grant it if there is transparency. If uh, the organization can look at what the, the teams are doing uh, and trust it, trust what they do, especially for the security aspect, um, but uh, not only. And um, also to provide a common baseline uh, in terms of um, uh, operations so that um, there is less specificity among apps. So we can have non-dedicated apps that would operate the apps in a, in a similar way. Um, so for this, we've, we are prototyping with um, an add-on on top of Cloud Foundry, which is called El Paso. Um, and which, uh, so 
or pass user can either use Cloud Foundry directly or they can go to El Paso through its UI and the APIs and El Paso will drive Cloud Foundry and the other services uh, that are not yet available in Cloud Foundry. And so in this, uh, in El Paso, we, we are enriching the data model of, uh, of Cloud Foundry with some stuff that are specific to, to our needs. Um, so mostly some, uh, some metadata that are necessary to integrate into the organization process. Um, so if we have notion of, um, of application, which we could have called that product uh, to, remind, to avoid the, the conflict naming with uh, uh, CF apps. Um, but well, it's, it's called application for now. Uh, with a set of users, and for each application, there is a version list of, uh, of releases. Um, and so the releases uh, get um, uh, um, a set of processing service and data services. And so it's kind of a template. Um, El Paso provides the templates of, uh, of applications um, with the associated metadata in each. Um, and so this translates into uh, the CF model through a mapping uh, mechanism, uh, which is pluggable. Um, and which allows us to, uh, to add some logic and, um, and to use to leverage the metadata that has been inserted by the team. Uh, and so this provides visibility and this allows, uh, it allows us to, um, to add some, some value and some um, uh, added, uh, additional security. Um, so for the standardized uh, operations, uh, we still have... Um, some work to be done, um, but uh, for example, on the reproducible aspect, uh, El Paso is uh, capturing what the application is um, supporting in terms of environment variables. Um, and so this is version in the um, uh, architecture, application architectures, uh, and so it makes it explicit. Um, and so the, the intimacy, the required intimacy between developers and ops gets a bit reduced with this explicit config. Uh, similar, the uh, binaries uh, origin um, are, um, are trust, and actually El Paso will fetch the binaries from the Maven Corp repository uh, and will do the deployment. So we have less reliance on scripts um, or develop uh, operations to be pulling the, the artifacts. Um, El Paso is doing that. Um, we still have a lot of work doing, to be done on, on logs um, to make it easier to, uh, to get logs, to change the log level uh, dynamically. Um, similar on metrics, uh, still a lot of work to be done to be able to, um, to get the app metrics through GMX, um, the container low level uh, metrics as well. Um, um, it's a bit, it's a bit maybe too small for you to read. Um, so, yeah, uh, for getting the normalized, um, the baseline operation across, uh, across apps, other stuff we are challenged with is uh, the app state. Uh, getting the, the teams are requiring uh, automated backups and restores um, or snapshots across the release deployment so that they can revert when, if, if ever that uh, automated database schema upgrade is failing across apps. So lots of stuff to, to be done around the app state. Uh, on the troubleshooting as well, um, to ease the troubleshooting uh, without uh, the app providing the, the features, um, like in Spring Boot, a creator. Uh, we'd like to find a way so that Java applications can be troubleshoot similar, uh, similarly. Okay. Um, so that was um, um, for the ops. Another stuff we've been trying to do is to involve the existing um, shared infrastructure expert uh, in the discussion um, and so that uh, they, can, they can help us um, better re reach our goals. Um, so when we look at uh, the other actors, uh, the off-stage actors, so the ones that are not directly using the pass but are influencing its adoption, um, in our case, um, we have also the transversal architects. And so we are starting asking them, okay, can you review um, what the Cloud Foundry is doing uh, and challenge it against the current best practice and the recommendation that you have acquired through the years? 
And so this, uh, this led to some inter interesting discussions, such as, for example, on the uh, uh, PHP side, um, one requirement to have a different user between staging and running, so that when um, to avoid and to prevent uh, code injection on the file system at runtime. So have different um, uh, group permission between um, uh, some files, uh, so that uh, if the application is vulnerable, uh, code won't be insert, injected on the file system. So it relies on, on user namespace. Um, so yeah, this, uh, this, uh, this has led to some interesting discussion. Um, um, and then some request back to, um, uh, to the path uh, and to the Cloud Foundry community. Uh, we're also working um, with transversal architect also as a way to reduce the kind of resistance um, to adoption. So to get their feedback and to have them um, um, capture the best practice and what they, they have acquired through the years um, to, um, so that then they can root project to us. And to use as well uh, Cloud Foundry as a way for them to evaluate upcoming technology as part of their work. Um, so the, the Bosch Docker release uh, seems uh, really a great way to, um, uh, to test that. Uh, it looks really uh, promising for that. Okay, um, so um, how can we adapt Cloud Foundry to our organization specific request requirements? Um, so first off is we use the existing Cloud Foundry extension and customization mechanism. Um, so you've seen some of this uh, during uh, the impact map uh, screenshots. Um, there's a lot of stuff we have not yet explored, um, but um, yeah, this is just exact ex uh, customization mechanism give us a great, feed, a great um, um, possibility uh, and we have a lot uh, more to, uh, to explore on our side. Another possibility is to fork Cloud Foundry extend and extend it. Um, so to insert some additional components, to replace some components. So there have been um, um, some great examples and blogs. Uh, no router from LDS Church is one example. Uh, some custom DAs. Um, we have chosen not to use this, uh, not to follow this route so far. Uh, because of limited resource that we have, and as well uh, for because of the time it takes um, uh, to adapt our core Java skills um, to Ruby and to Golang. Um, and so one other alternative um, um, uh, to adapting Cloud Foundry to our organization specific requirements is that I was presenting is um, having an add-on on top of Cloud Foundry to capture additional um, metadata and to fit better in the, in the processes. Um, um, so we can think a, bit, a little bit about what potential future Cloud Foundry extension could help us um, to remove some of the specifics that we have done, or at least to, it to be um, um, to have a smoother integration. Um, and so one thing we were uh, thinking of is um, the ability to have metadata attached to the Cloud Foundry entities. A bit similar to AWS allows us to put some tags on uh, instances and services and then query those entities and to get a um, uh, charge uh, with a breakdown of those tags. So this would, um, would really help um, to be maybe in a form of tags, tags to be attached to application, to space of two services to tell whether the, the application is production or development, uh, what kind of ops entity it's related to, uh, the ad code name, um, that would fill then the, um, the configuration management d database, uh, the CMDB on the ops side, uh, that would fill the, um, uh, as well the change management processes. Um, um, and another aspect uh, we were thinking about is, um, to insert, intercept some of the CC API verbs. Um, so maybe through the upcoming router service uh, or maybe some kind of plugging on the cloud controller um, in order to have some more fine grain uh, access control um, to be able to more finally um, tune which uh, entities um, that, um, that we need to control. 
uh, or potentially to do transformations on the verbs, um, such as um, um, maybe pulling dynamically the app binaries. Uh, uh, I do a safe push by putting the Maven uh, app, um, Maven artifact uh, coordinates, and uh, dynamically this interceptor will pull the, the binaries uh, from the repo and, uh, and get it, and maybe extensions and new verbs. Um, so I'll be talking a bit more tomorrow about um, El Paso open source uh, that I was presenting uh, before. Uh, we are open sourcing that, and um, I'll be detailing more with a screenshot uh, use case uh, uh, in more detail what we are trying to achieve. Um, um, so the idea of this um, uh, introduction was to, to see if we could share our organization-specific requirements, uh, the way we, we have adopted Cloud, uh, Cloud Foundry to, to those so far, uh, what challenges um, are remaining. So I invited, I'm inviting you to meet tomorrow at 10.40 um, a.m. Uh, for our related buff. And uh, for this, thank you very much.